Darren here. Uh, I've recently hit a vein of sweet, bouncy 80s pop in my ongoing Lifetime of Listening series of videos. So to balance that out, how about something savoury? Baby spicy! Ooh yeah! A touch of genuine scuzz for the more seasoned palate. Here are 12 albums by 12 bands from arguably the greatest pure noise rock label of the 1990s. That's Amphetamine Reptile Records out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Consider Amrep the disfigured evil twin brother to uh, Seattle Sub Pop, if you like, locked away in the basement of history, but uh, let loose here in this list to uh, terrorise the yuppie neighbours. Note that Amrep has undergone a kind of low-key renaissance in the last 10, 15 years or so as a kind of reissue imprint for some of its premium acts. But uh, in this video, I'm only considering releases from the initial incarnation from the late 80s up to the brink of the millennium. Uh, there's a Spotify playlist in the uh, description down below. But where albums are missing from that uh, platform, um, I'll link to the occasional rip here on YouTube. As ever, please try and support the original artists uh, wherever possible. So let's start at the beginning. And first up, uh, number one on the list, uh, Music for Insect Minds by Halo of Flies. It's a compilation of all the band's early single and EP releases between 1986 and 1991. Halo of Flies, uh, a scabrous stew of early hardcore, a 60s acid garage, and clanky post-punk, a trio led by singing guitarist and principal songwriter Tom Hazelmeyer. And it was Tom, uh, the Haze, a Minneapolis native who'd pitched up in Seattle whilst uh, enrolled in the Marines, uh, who started the label, uh, initially purely to release his own band's material. A few years of manning the label out of the barracks, <laughs> I kid you not, and uh, Tom left the service, relocated back home to Minneapolis, and hooked up with Twin Tone Records, who gave a, a leg up to the fledgling uh, Amphetamine Reptile, allowing them to move beyond singles uh, and into EPs, uh, 12 inches, full length albums. As the label grew, Tom found himself uh, less involved in music creation uh, and much deeper into the nuts and bolts of the record production, manufacture, promotion and sleeve design, especially sleeve design, which uh, Tom handled a lot of uh, in the early life of the label. But Halo of Flies, don't overlook them as a n other low-rent punk band. Music for Insect Minds is a great document of DIY mid-80s post-hardcore noise rock. Yeah, important in an AMREP evolutionary sense and, uh, in my opinion, a great time capsule recording. Uh, at two from 1990, I've got Effet and Impudent Snobs by Cows. Not the first full length on the label. Heck, not even the first Cows album one on the label. Uh, that would be 1989's Daddy Has a Tail. But this one really sums up much of the attitude, the obsessions, the aesthetic of both the label as a whole and of Cows, a Minneapolis uh, band who released almost exclusively on AMREP. This is surreal, blaring, willfully ragged music combining ugly lyrical themes, bizarre instrumentation. Uh, singer Shannon Selberg would pick up a trombone or a bugle for the occasional number. Um, all buried under an avalanche of, you know, greasy, bulbous, punk rock riffing and ever-present feedback. You could point a finger at this kind of thing and argue the butthole surfers did it first, but this is far less trippy, uh, less jammy, uh, much more primitive, uh, brutally, shapelessly nihilistic. Am I selling this? I, I don't know. It is enjoyable. Um, just get your head in the right place before diving deep and uh, you'll be okay. Yeah, a whole two stars on all music if that helps seal the deal. At three, uh, from the same year, uh, Nationwide by Surgery, uh, one of a number of bands uh, leaning into the blues at the turn of the 90s. Think the whole uh, John Spencer axis of Pussy Galore, Boss Hog, who also released on AMRAP, uh, The Blues Explosion, and Royal Shrucks, Dead Moon. Um, you could trace a line back even further to the Gun Club, uh, Flat Duo Jets, the Gories even. But Surgery were hewing much closer to a melodic, grungy, post-hardcore blues hybrid, I think, than most of their peers. Nationwide was uh, the band's only full-length for Amphetamine Reptile before the grunge tsunami swept them over to the majors for 1994's uh, Shimmer album uh, on Atlantic. A very promising band whose career was cut brutally short by singer Sean McDonald's sudden death uh, from a severe asthma attack in 1995. 
I think Nationwide beats out that major label album. It's a great grungy outlier with, you know, neat, tight, chugly riffing. Uh, maybe consider Amrep's version of Sub Pop's uh, Love Battery, you know, another great guitar act of the period who also fiddled with the grunge template a little too freely to land well with the, you know, MTV sanctioned grunge crowd. Uh, fourth up, I've got uh, Boxing the Clown by Helios Creed from also 1990. Here's one where you can flip that Buttholes Association from earlier on its head uh, with, you know, Creed's first band, that was Chrome, being themselves hugely uh, influential on the surface. Yeah, Chrome-worthy, original, spacey, acid-fried concept punks sporting a very creepy industrial edge. Helios Creed found a home, uh, and as natural a fit as you could hope for, really, uh, on Amphetamine Reptile for a run of albums uh, in the first half of the 90s, of which I think Boxing the Clown uh, may well be the pick. Frazzled, squiggly, wormy riffing, pinched, wah-heavy slabs of noise, all riveted to the album's charred bulkhead via some colossal hits from X scratch acid Jesus Lizard drumming legend Ray Washam. Another case, I think, of post-punk, post-hardcore sounds pushing out into different territory, in this case, psychedelic rock, and finding a very warm welcome for them at Amrep. Next, a five, the album that essentially bankrolled Amrep for the majority of its 90s salad days. Uh, this, from 1990, again, is Helmet and Strap It On. Uh, this album was licensed and re-released by Interscope uh, a year later to herald the band's major label debut, Meantime, which followed in 1992. And I think uh, this is as good as Helmet got. Uh, their subsequent stuff tended towards the alt metal, maybe even creating the template for the big shorts, you know, sports, metal, later in the decade. Although I, I do respect Paige Hamilton's taste too much to ever lay the blame for Limp Bizkit and their ilk entirely at his feet. Savagely clipped cubes of high gain filth, dropping like mortars, tight roomy drums, barked drill yard exhortations, uh, strap it on, does it all in a compact 30 minute workout that to me uh, is all the helmets I, and maybe you, uh, will ever need. Plus they have a little fun here on my favourite track, that's Make Room, which does all that stuff I just said, but with a finger snapping, biker movie swing, that makes you sit up and go, what is that? Like I said, uh, the band that bought Amrep uh, a degree of comfort during a period when majors mounting dawn raids on indie label rosters was a seemingly daily occurrence. Now at six, a band I've brought up on the channel at least twice before from 1991. This is Tar and Jackson. Confession, I love these guys as you can see. Uh, everything here from the debut Handsome EP all the way through to their Touch and Go releases, including this groovy split cover version 7 inch with Jewel Box. Uh, it's all awesome stuff in my book. And basically for me, Tar are the band that Helmet should be. The same teeth clenched vocal style, an almost supernatural sense of timing. I check out the stop start riffing on Walking the King here. A thick, pummeling, dual guitar and bass attack with dark, submerged, declamatory lyrics. But Tar are the churning rust belt contraptions to Helmet's state of the art, precision tooled factories. The only metal here are the sheets of aluminium they clad their instruments with. This is all dank, spooked, high volume post hardcore. Apparently there's a little uh, residual resentment from Hayes regarding the band's jump to Touch and Go in 1993, which is a shame. But for me, Amrep got the best of them and the Albini production on Jackson is thickly oppressive, huge, overpowering. Uh, one of the label's best sounding releases, in my opinion. And if Jackson is one of Amrep's best, at seven, I've got one of the label's most unique. It's very hard to think of a better fit than this band and this label. They seem to encapsulate everything that's great about each other. From 1992, this is War on Everybody by God Bullies. Uh, this LP marks the end of the band's four album run on Amphetamine Reptile, beginning with 1989's Plastic Eye Miracle, uh, before switching to Alternative Tentacles for their final album, 1994's Kill the King. One of the great lost cult US bands of the 90s? I think, I think maybe yes. A psych rock freak show of acid guitar stooges riffs. They were Michigan natives as well. Treated vocals and creepy spoken word and B-movie samples. Yeah, I think this stuff at the time was labelled creep rock. And for the band, a frontman for the ages in Mike Hard, 
suited like he's attending a sales conference at an out-of-town business park, but watch as he transforms into a fiery preacher, beating himself, disrobing, burning Bible passages, convulsing, going walkabout. And that's probably why God bullies aren't quite at the forefront of people's minds. The, the records are actually pretty great. Yeah, it's between this one and 89's Mama Womb Womb for me, but it's in the live arena that they really brought the madness uh, so often the way with bands like this. And it's a tough thing to bottle. There are live videos out there of them in their prime. So go check them out, see what you think, uh, and then try war on everybody. It should all make sense. Next up at eight uh, from 1993, I've got Supernova by Today is the Day. I won't dwell too long on Today is the Day as they have nurtured a fairly sizable following in more difficult metal circles over the years. And metal, if I've never been 100% clear on this before, is just not my thing. But uh, this debut album has Steve Austin's tortured, complex, screamo guitar noise steering closer to post-hardcore than they do nowadays. Certainly enough water between them and metal that it passes my sniff test. Just. They're here on this list for being a significant and influential member of the Amrette family, releasing three albums for the label during their earliest and most interesting to me phase. Uh, much more love from me uh, for the next couple of entries here, starting at nine with Guzzard and their 1993 album, Get a Witness. Uh, not so much love from the internet, however, as this band were one of only a tiny number of uh, wiki wax I encountered in the Amrep stable uh, and Google. Uh, no, I did not mean to search for King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. An album a year between 1994 and 96 for this trio of Minneapolitans, is that a word? Uh, who for me are a pretty tasty listen even today. Pitching up somewhere between the bituminous heft of tar and the galloping dynamic of drive like Jehu at their most abrasively incessant. If you like your post hardcore a little bit mathy, a little bit garagey, you will enjoy Guzzard immensely. I love the debut album, Get a Witness. Clearly, it's my pick here, but the other two are snapping at its heels. It's a very compact and enjoyable body of work, and I see no one talking about these albums nowadays. Go seek them out. Uh, similarly, at 10 here, I've got from 1994, Into the Vortex by Hammerhead. Almost a carbon copy situation. Yet another great Minneapolis trio plowing their own furrow. But sonically, a different proposition to Guzzard, I think. Definitely closer in post-hardcore terms to the DC Discord sound, uh, at least to me. Like Guzzard, three albums on Amphetamine Reptile, and honestly, as perfect a reflection of the wider evolution of the post-hardcore sound, you could not hope to find. They started out fast, aggressive, mean, and got progressively more structurally nuanced and adventurous, while still staying mean. I've plumped for the Goldilocks slap bang in the middle choice of Into the Vortex, but as with Guzzard, dig in and root around. Okay, 11, and the closest thing I think Amrep ever had to a genuine grunge act, that's Chokeball and their 1996 album, A Taste for Bitters. Why that grunge label? Well, they were handpicked uh, by Kurt Cobain for what turned out to be Nirvana's last run of shows, 93 going into early 94, before his suicide. But that grunge link feels like a surface thing. Uh, the band's evolution saw them physically relocate from Honolulu in Hawaii to LA and musically pivot from grungy noise to, by the time of this album, a much slower, more introspective, more interesting prospect altogether. Yeah, A Taste of Bitters tracks a similar trajectory to Nirvana's In Utero to my ears. Pulling in from a lot of grunge and post-hardcore influences, yes. Gnarly and abrasive in places, but pulling back in others. Hints of, you know, lo-fi queese and slowcore drama creeping in. Maybe the prettiest and least transgressive thing Amrep ever put out, and worth chasing down, I think, uh, if it's avoided you thus far. And finally at 12, the closing bracket, if you like, to that Halo of Flies opener we started with this is Honky by Melvins from 1997. The band had a long association with Amrep via singles, compilation appearances, and yes, a few full-length albums, but they were never fully considered as, I think, an amphetamine reptile band, having been associated with a ton of labels, indies and majors along the way. But they are one of the um, legacy acts that the rebooted label is is currently reissuing, so they're as good a place uh, to end as any. 
I could always take him or leave him personally, but um, the freedom AMRAP gave the band allowed them to explore their more experimental side and release genuinely weird head scratches like Honky, which tempers their trademark sludge with odd ambient excursions. It's weird, it's noisy, trippy, dark, a bit spooky, which would kind of set the tone for a lot of their subsequent, you know, more challenging releases via mostly uh, uh, Ipecac recordings, who you could consider uh, the nearest thing to an AMREP we have in the 21st century. But that is Amphetamine Reptile in a dozen records. Uh, your mileage may vary. There are other bands who could have got to mention here. Uh, Janitor Joe, Unsane, uh, Cosmic Psychos. But these are what I would consider core reptile. I think the label's achievements get a little overlooked these days, uh, probably down to the lack of a, you know, a big tent, a big draw on the roster. You know, SST had Black Flag, Minutemen, Huskers. Touch and Go had Big Black, The Butthole, Slint, Matador, Pavement, Yola Tango, GBV. AMREP were less top heavy, more thinly spread, you could argue, uh, but no less interesting, I think, and home to a lot of unique, innovative, and often quite challenging artists, which in my book are all things that deserve to be celebrated. And there you have it, Amphetamine Reptile Records. Were you a fan? Were there any bands on this label that you particularly took to or took a particular dislike to? Why don't you comment down below and uh, we can talk further. As ever, thanks if you've got this far into the video. Uh, please think about liking or subscribing if you haven't done so already. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, um, I will see you again soon. You take care. Bye for now.